Hi everyone, I'm Robert Lilov. I'm a postdoc at the Technion in Israel. And today I would like to tell you about a project I'm doing together with Adi Nasser, namely to generate constraint realizations as a means of probing the cosmic structure growth. Now, when you think about constraining structure formation or cosmology in general, you usually think about using large scale averaged statistical properties uh, for which you then compare theoretical predictions with the observations. So, Typical example, of course, would be the meta power spectrum, but also higher order endpoint correlation functions or the halo mass function, for example. Now, what I want to talk about today is rather using the specific distribution of, of the structures traced by galaxies around us and their flow uh, as a cosmological probe. Now, for example, you can investigate if the observed motion of the local group with respect to the CMB is actually uh, explained by the structures we observe given the cosmological model. Or, and this is what I will focus mostly on today, is to probe the growth rate of structures. Now, the structures we observe, observe have to satisfy the continuity equation. And assuming the linear regime, this gives us a very simple relation where I just have a direct proportionality between the divergence of the peculiar velocity field of those galaxies and their well, density, their density contrast, delta g. Now the proportionality constant is for one partially given by um, the Hubble constant H naught, but more importantly for us here, beta, which is a galaxy density contrast growth rate. Now you can relate it to the more usually known growth rate for matter f just simply by dividing by the uh, linear galaxy bias factor. And then if you, for example, assume a lambda CDM model, can F also relate to the meta density parameter omega m? Now, basically having this relation in mind, you can see that if you have two independent observations allowing you to compare velocities and uh, densities in our local universe, this allows you to constrain beta. Now, at first glance, you might think, okay, that looks completely uh, degenerate with H0, but we'll actually see later and talking about this in detail, that is not the case. Now, our approach here basically proceeds in two main steps. First of all, we use a redshift survey uh, as the first input, from which we reconstruct the density contrast, but most importantly, the peculiar velocity field around us. And secondly, we compare these peculiar velocities with those obtained from an independent direct peculiar velocity survey. All right, so that one, the redshift survey. So the survey we're using here is TUMAS, the TUMAS redshift survey, which is the densest uh, all sky redshift survey to date. It's very useful for this exercise. Now it contains the redshifts of approximately 45,000 galaxies, uh, reaching an effective depth of a redshift of roughly 0.05 and covers 91% of the sky. So it's all sky in a sense, as you can see down here, everything except the synthlies where our galactic disk and bulge are. Now, TMS has a nice property of full completeness with respect to very well-defined um, survey limits, namely that you observe all the galaxies that when observed in the uh, KS, near infrared band, have a magnitude below 11.75. And using this survey will allow us to get a detailed reconstruction out to 200 megaparsec over H. Now, to do the actual reconstruction, we are basically combining different existing methods and extending those. So the main ingredient is a method originally devised by Fisher and, and collaborators in the mid-90s. And we'll just guide you through the main steps. First of all, observations of the galaxy redshifts are of course in redshift space. So we have to first correct for these redshift space distortions before we can re relate them to the peculiar velocities. Now the redshift coordinate R is of course given by the uh, observed redshift space, the real space coordinate R is of course given by the redshift space coordinate S corrected for the radial velocity component of said galaxy. And on the level of a density contrast, we're considering only linear corrections. So by doing a first order Taylor expansion, getting this relation between the galaxy density contrast in real and redshift space. Now, of course, you need to know the peculiar velocity for this correction, which we want to 
uh, we construct. But the advantage of doing this on a linear level means that we can actually do this in one self-consistent step rather than having some iterative process. Fine, assuming we do this, we have our galaxy density and real space. Problem is still, this is subject to noise, observational noise. As we're not observing the density itself directly, but rather having a discrete set of galaxies as tracers, it's of course subject to shock noise. And the way we're dealing uh, with this is by applying a Wiener filter. Now the Wiener filter, very basically, is given by taking the uh, two-point correlation between the underlying signal that we want to reconstruct, the actual underlying density field, and uh, our observed data, which is in our case uh, limited by shot marks, and dividing this by the autocorrelation of the data of itself. So the effect of this is if you're in a regime where you are, like, have a high signal to noise, and the data is essentially just given by the, uh, by the signal, the whole Wiener filter cancels out the protest unity and leaves the data pretty much untouched. But in those regimes where you have low signal to noise, where your data are noise dominated, this inverse data data covariance suppresses everything. And we're basically only focusing on those parts of the data um, which have a high signal to noise. So in that sense, it's a conservative estimate. Now, if our signal noise would be Gaussian random fields, then this would actually coincide with the uh, mean of that field. And of course, in reality, when we observe nowadays structures, that is not the case. So the signal we want to reconstruct of the density is not Gaussian, but it's at least first order approximated by a log normal distribution instead. And the noise is also not Gaussian because we have some sampling process from the underlying field to the galaxies we observe, which at first order is uh, Poissonian noise. However, the nice property of a Wiener filter is also that even if it's not Gaussian, regardless of what um, probability distribution you have underlying there, it always preserves the property of being a minimum variance estimator, meaning uh, it minimizes the variance between the reconstruction and the actual underlying signal, which is a very useful property that means even for this non-Gaussian case, it's still a conservative estimate that we can use. Now, I wrote this here very abstractly with signal and data because there's still a question like in which representation, which space are we actually using our densities here? For example, you could use the real space representation where the data is really uh, the galaxy density field on a, a 3D grid in space. But of course, it makes the inversion rather expensive given a certain size of the survey. Usually, if you want to diagonalize correlation functions, you go to Fourier space. However, it's not as easy here because the shot noise is actually not the same everywhere, but it's growing with radius. The reason is that we have a flux limit of the survey. So here on the right, if you look at the redshift distribution of 2MS, you can see that rather than growing completely with a, a square of a distance, it drops off just because galaxies become too faint to be observed. So we have this radio dependence, which actually leads to the case that even if we go to Fourier space, all modes are still covered and we haven't worn anything. However, the nice property is it only covers radio modes, and at the same time also the redshift space distortions only affect the radial direction. So that means that we can choose like a maximally diagonal, maximally uncorrelated space, namely spherical Fourier vessel space. So by this I mean we expand the density field in spherical vessel function as well as spherical harmonics. So this is basically the optimal space for this reconstruction because the filter becomes maximal diagonal and the inversions only take place in the radial mode M, whereas L and M, our angular modes are independent. So this makes this approach more efficient and also way more scalable because it basically only depends on the radial extent of the survey rather than the volume. All right, now with this reconstruction in hand, we still have to consider A, that we're basically not only suppressing the noise of Wiener filter, but also part of the signal of its variance, and B, that we also have still need the means to properly assess the uncertainty in this reconstruction. And like the most rigorous way to address this is to use constraint realizations, for which we follow the approach of Hoffman and Rilak. And the idea is that constraint realizations basically describe the whole ensemble of all possible reconstructions which are compatible with the observed data 
within the noise rather than just having one mean estimate or one mean fit estimate. So the idea is then that you generate some mock realization of your signal, subtract from this the Wiener fit applied to the, to the respective mock data, which together describes some correlated noise, which you then add to the Wiener fit estimate of your actual data, in our case from 200. Now, uh, to account for the non Gaussianities I already mentioned, what we have to do is for the mock um, data, the mock density contours, what we use is we sample this or we generate this from a correlated log normal distribution. And then to get the mock data for the galaxies, we perform a Poisson sampling on top of this. Now, while um, this way of doing constraint realization is only like only takes into account the constraints exactly, again, for Gaussian fields, it still has a nice property that even for these non Gaussian fields, it constrains the data on the level of the variance, on the two point level, which is completely sufficient for our application and keeps everything way more efficient than sampling from the full conditional distribution. Now down here, you see um, a slice through the supergalactic plane of one of these constraint realizations on the left for the full, full size, on the right is zoom in. Uh, uh, the color map and the contours uh, show the density contrast, where the arrows show the velocity field. And one thing we can directly notice is that you nicely reproduce all the well-known structures you would expect, like Virgo, Coma, or further out to the Chapley cluster. All right. But to get a better idea of what these constraint realizations actually do on top of the Wiener filter estimate, you can look at, have a look at the residual between these constraint realizations and this Wiener estimate. And this is what you see here. First of all, you can maybe already guess from this, this is really not just a completely random realization, it actually is correlated Poisson or log normal noise that we see here. And you can directly see that you, the amplitude of this noise increases for, towards the larger radii, as you would expect it. To quantify this a bit more nicely, what you can do is now just take the variance of this residual over a certain set of, in this case, 100 constraint realizations, and which is shown here as the blue curve for the density contrast and the radio velocity component, and compare this to the intrinsic variance for the signal, given the statistics we assume as power spectrum, which is shown here in dotted orange. And you can clearly see that the noise, which represents our reconstruction uncertainty in this case, increases with radius. So where it's for density contrast around 0.1, close to the lower group, and for the velocities, 60 to 70 kilometers per second, it slowly approaches the intrinsic uh, variance when going to the boundary of our uh, reconstruction volume. For example, for the velocities, then we end up in the order of 270, 280 kilometers per second. Right. Now we have these reconstructed these constraint realizations. They still depend on the growth rate beta internally. So to fix this, we need now our independent set of data for which we choose the cosmic flows catalog. Now cosmic flows, cosmic flows three specifically, is a compilation, a large compilation of galaxy, of actual galaxy distances, which have been assessed using various different heuristic methods. So for example, um, the Tali Fisher and the fundamental plane relations mainly for spheric, uh, um, for different elliptical and spiral galaxies. And, but also for example, the type 1a supernova distance measurements. In total, it contains roughly 18,000 galaxies grouped into a bit more than 11,000 galaxy groups. And in contrast to the Oscar Redshift survey, you can already see here by a picture of a uh, scatter plot of the cosmic flows on the right, it's much more heterogeneous just because we combine different methods, different surveys, which is the color coding here. But this is no problem for us here because the comparison we will do will be on a point by point level. So we don't require the all sky property for this. Now, specifically to uh, estimate or to constrain the value of beta, what we will do is compare the distances that are measured by cosmic flows with those that we would expect, given the observed redshifts, corrected by our, by our uh, reconstructed velocity. So this is the delta mu here that we want to minimize. These are the log distances observed in cosmic flows. These are the observed redshifts, and we have to correct those by our reconstructed velocities 
to get the expected uh, distance modulus for those. Now, there are two things we have to be aware of here. First of all, the 2MS volume itself is rather small. In that sense, that the velocities within the 2MS volume are still have contributions from sources outside of 2MS. So, which can't be ignored here if we want to uh, do this comparison in absolute terms. So, what we do is we uh, assume that the whole contribution from sources beyond 2MS can be described by like one bulk flow external velocity, which we add to our reconstructions and which we leave as a free parameter. In addition, as I already mentioned at the beginning, even though it looked like beta and H0 would be very degenerate, actually this degeneracy is lost here because we have to divide our reconstructed velocities by H0 again for this comparison, so this is gone. Only H0 dependence is left, it's kind of a residual one due to the uh, luminosity distance entering the definition of mu. But for our purposes, even though we leave beta, the three components of Vx as well as H0 as three parameters, H0 is basically just a nuisance parameter here. Now, to get the best fit values, we basically have a two step approach here. So, for our whole set, in our case again, 100 constraint realizations, we compute the best fit values for these three parameters just by doing a chi square minimization with respect to this delta mu. And then, afterwards, we take the average over all of these best individual best fit values, which then accounts for the scatter due to our reconstruction uh, uncertainty. Uh, this has a nice advantage that we can directly separate these two error contributions. Just by using the scatter between constraint realization is our uh, reconstruction noise, whereas the average uh, error of the chi-square fit quantifies the noise due to, uh, due to the observational noise, observational uncertainty of the cosmic flow distances. Now, if we do this exercise and apply it to the data, we find this distribution for the growth rate beta down here with the optimal value found by this method being 0.43 with an error of uh, roughly 7%. And I split it up here in the two different contributions. As you can see for beta, the contribution from our reconstruction uncertainty and the CF rate distances is roughly the same. All right, so I already mentioned in the beginning that you can relate beta to the more common meta-linear growth function f. And the most usual way you do it is rather than trying to constrain the galaxy bias vector v itself, you rather work via um, the galaxy density variance, so sigma eight g. And multiplying this, which you get from independent measurements with our growth rate beta, effectively gives you the parameter combination f sigma eight. Now, it's a very close value because sigma eight for the galaxies is very close to one. Given this value, we can now compare this to a whole set of other literature values using different methods, which is shown down here in the lower right. So the value on the very left, this is our result, and the color coding represents different types of methods. Orange ones are all ones that uh, use peculiar velocities, blue ones uh, work via uh, redshift and isotropic and isotropies and green ones luminosity fluctuations. But all of these three groups are basically using the local universe just in different ways. You can see we are not only consistent with those, but also have very competitive error bars. Uh, the interesting one is the red one over here, which is not from the local universe, but it's actually the value you get from Planck. So from a global cosmological parameter fit. And the most important fact to notice here is that our uh, independent measurements based on the local universe are consistent with Planck. In that sense, we have consistency with the lambda CDM expectation. Now, beyond the growth rate, I want to look at one more thing during this talk, namely constraints we get on large scale velocities. First of all, we had this external bulk flow as a free parameter and our, and our fitting procedure, and the results we found for this are of the order of 300 kilometers per second. So that means there's actually quite a sizable amount of uh, velocity contribution due to sources outside of 2MS is still affecting the local group motion and its surrounding. So we really have to take this into account. Uh, large scale bike floations beyond the, the, uh, the, the extent of 2MS. Now, what we can do now, what I mentioned also in the beginning, is we can actually now 
take our reconstructed uh, velocity of the local group and compare it with the observed dipole velocity with respect to C and B. And of course, due to this strong uh, external uh, velocity contribution, we have to look at the sum of our naive 2MLS only reconstruction with this external contribution and compare this. This is shown below here. So what we find is a local group motion of the order of 650 kilometers per second, which matches uh, the observed 622 really well on the arrows. Also the directions uh, are in a good agreement, not quite as good as the uh, magnitude, but still within two signals. One interesting fact, or one important fact I want to point out here is also that the, while the errors on the individual fit for this external bulk motion were really large and also dominated by our reconstruction uncertainty rather than the CF3 distances, this is not the case for the sum uh, of these two contributions up here anymore. So the errors are much lower and specifically the reconstruction uncertainty went down. Now the reason for this is that the value for the local group that we get from our constraint realizations for each individual constraint realization is not independent for the external bike velocity we fit to it, but they are strongly correlated to count for the distances from cosmic flow three. And it's this strong correlation which actually means that the sum of the two is much more strongly constrained than the individual parts, which also shows a big advantage of using this full set of constraint realizations, which keep track of these correlations between the velocities at all the points, rather than just estimating errors for these individual quantities and adding them up. And with this, I want to come to my conclusion. Uh, I hope I could show you that you can use constraint realizations based on the Wiener filter to get a robust reconstruction of the structure in our local universe, including a very thorough error estimate of this reconstruction. Then how you can combine these reconstructions, these realizations with an independent set of galaxy distances, allowing you to constrain uh, the growth rate of structures. And the results we find for this growth rate parameter are consistent with the lambda CDM expectation. Now, lastly, for some outlook, uh, all the error estimates I've given so far basically only account for the statistical error. So what we're currently doing is taking high resolution and body simulations, including realistic mock galaxy catalogs, to check for systematic effects that might not be accounted by our method. For example, we compare only linear velocity units with the nonlinear galaxy velocities, or maybe the Poissonian um, sampling assumption could lead to some bias. So we're currently assessing this and if necessary, calibrate for this. Then once all of this is done, the code computing all of the constraint realizations will be publicly available. So anyone with an interest can use it and generate these. And due to the very efficient uh, linear and spherical Fourier Bessel algorithm we're using here, this actually runs very easily on your laptop. Lastly, like a bit more future um, outlook is that the next big thing with regards to future all sky spectral redshift service will be Spherex, which is supposed to launch in mid 2020s. It will be much larger than two MSs now. We'll have an effective depth rather in the range of one or two uh, with regards to redshifts, meaning the number of galaxies is by a factor of a thousand higher and true my S roughly 450 million galaxies are expected. So um, this is really the point where the efficiency and the scalability of this algorithm will really come into play. So even though, of course, this won't be like laptop level anyways anymore, but this efficient and scalable algorithm still will make it rather feasible and efficient to extend our method to this much larger um, data volume. Now, so we plan to prepare our algorithm to do this to account for like, the higher level of um, parallelization necessary to do this. All right, and with this, I would like to come to an end. I thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your discussions. Thank you.